is a long one. Oh, my Nothing God. but net. Welcome to another episode of All Nat, brought to you by OTS. I am your host, Natalie, but most people call me Nat. And today, we have a really, really, really great guest. I have Joe Farai. Did I say that correctly? There you go. Um, If you are a, a Dub Nation on Twitter, NBA Twitter, Dub Twitter, you will know Joe. His writing is excellent but what you might really know him for if you're on twitter is all of his um breakdowns of the game so do threads breaking down different moments of the game and if you are an nba junkie like me and you like to learn the game joe is such an excellent person to learn from i don't know how he even knows the things that he does like i mean the game happens so quickly and you have to go back and um you know, really look at it, but the way he breaks it down and understands the sets and the plays that the Warriors run, it's really, he could be a coach out there on the team. I I love, I love like looking at his video clips. I love reading his work. His mind is so brilliant and I am ecstatic to sit down and talk to you today. So thank you so much, Joe, for joining the show. Um, He's going to tell you all the handles where you can find him, but his work is on Golden State of Mind. It's also featured on Dub HQ. Did I get Dub Nation Nation HQ? Dub Nation HQ. So um, yeah, it's going to be a treat today, Joe. Thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. I mean, we've been planning this for a while now, and it's so great to be finally here talking about basketball. I mean, any every time we talk about Warriors, basketball, anything, uh, it's a good day, and it's something I'm passionate about. So thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Clearly. I mean, you know, I think one of the best things about, I think, All Matt for me has been putting some faces to some of the names, you know, of the people we interact with on Twitter. Um, I think there's so many brilliant minds and, you know, a lot of times we don't get to see people's faces or hear them talk. So I definitely know you're one of the people, like a couple of times people are always trying to pick my brain, like, who are you going to have on? And when I've mentioned at some point you'd be on the show, people were really excited, like, oh my gosh, Joe is so good. So you're really a fan favorite and you're really popular. So really, thank you. Sure. I'm uh, not much of a talker, actually, so that's why I don't have a, like a, any podcast or anything like that. But yeah, I'll try my best to uh, articulate all of my work, all of my thoughts uh, into this uh, format. So yeah. I'm sure it'll be great. Um, I mean, so I mean, to just get right into it, we got some news a little bit earlier today about Draymond Green going into health and safety protocol. So that's now what, like the seventh? person or I mean that's not the seventh person in protocols but I think that makes seven guys out for us total if you include Clay yeah. and Wiseman but I think that's the fifth person for protocols right is it the fifth or the fourth we, we have, have Wiggins, um, um, Wiggins Poole Moody, B- Moody Moody oh yeah it's the fifth yeah Gray's I forgot about fifth. Moody yeah yeah so the fifth guy but I mean he is probably the most crucial person we've lost to this mm-hmm. point. I mean, I think the way that I've been looking at it is like, as long as you have Steph and Dre out there, we can probably manage and still pull out wins. Um, losing Dre is critical. I mean, he's the second most important, like the only person worse than that could be Steph, right? And so, I mean, we have some big games coming up. So I think we could should probably start talking about that first from the extent of just having, you know, Dre out of the the lineup and what that will mean. And this week, they're going to be playing the Denver Nuggets twice. Um, So already kind of a big matchup just because you have Jokic, who's having a tremendous year. Um, He's the reigning MVP. Many people are advocating and arguing that he should be the front runner for MVP. Um, I don't agree with that. I'm curious to know your thoughts. But um, He's a, a, a he's in the top, you know, he's in the race. Definitely. He's a leading MVP candidate and he's been carrying that Denver Nuggets team. They're depleted right now. They don't have Jamal Murray, who they're still waiting to get back. They lost Michael Porter Jr. Uh, and so we're going to face off against them. 
Uh, they've been hovering around 500. They did lose Joker for, I think, about five games this season. But nonetheless, they've been hovering around 500, give or take. And so we're going to face them now. And at least going into that matchup, we know we don't have Draymond plus a number of other guys. It's possible that we might get pulled back before that game. It's at home. So what are your thoughts going into that matchup, knowing the state of the team right now? Well, obviously, Draymond being out means that there's one less body to throw against Jokic, right? Um, Looney can handle Jokic, I would think, just because he's a big body. Obviously, Jokic has that height advantage, and he's a bit hefty too, I would say. And Bielitsa, Bielitsa does better against uh, a defender if it's a post-up, one-on-one matchup. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean... Uh, it's going to be tough because Jokic is a different breed. <laughs> He's a whole different kind of player that we haven't even seen before, I would argue. Maybe the most... I haven't the... seen like in terms of him being like a center, like a big man or... Uh, being just... a center, like his skill, his offensive skill set is so varied for a person of his size. Okay. Uh, maybe perhaps historically the closest... Uh, comparison that you can make is uh maybe an Arvidas Sabonis maybe okay. if you had an Arvidas Sabonis who entered the league at maybe around 25 or something like that that would be the closest comparison but other than that it's Jokic is one of a kind um the way he just passes the way he can just get his own buckets you know people forget he is uh one of the best scorers in the league you know Definitely. um uh, he averages, if I remember correctly, around 25, 26 points per game this season, yeah, which isn't bad. You know, it's not, yeah. not bad at all. Uh, unfortunately, the Nuggets have been hit with their own bouts of injuries, COVID and all that, and their record is 15 and 16. So I don't, I wouldn't argue that Jokic is part of the MVP conversation, but I do, uh, I do agree with you that he's not the front runner. Be- just because of that team record, you know, um, there's this argument that team record should have a big part in it. It's always been part of the argument, really. It has. And, you know, you can't really eliminate that that part of the equation, you know. And I'm not saying it's an apples to apples comparison, but last season, Steph was kind of in the same boat. Right. Where he was in the MVP conversation, but the record, um, the record virtually eliminated him from winning it. Uh, even though, you know, if we're being honest, Jokic did have much better metrics and stats last season compared to Steph. But the point stands that if you're going to hold Steph to the same standards in terms of records, you should hold everyone else to the same standards too. So I think Jokic, he's been playing well, but he shouldn't really be the front runner for MVP. But that doesn't really eliminate the fact that he's, he's damn awesome, you know? It's like, I just love watching him play. and. The dubs, I think, they'll have a tough time against Jokic just because Draymond is out. But it's certainly winnable just because uh, besides Jokic, besides Aaron Gordon, uh, they're not really that deep right now. No, they're not. Yeah. They're not. And that's why, honestly, the the matchup really didn't scare me that much. I mean, like, even before we, like, obviously when I knew Dre was still playing, it didn't scare me at all. I thought they were winnable games. I thought... I thought Denver's biggest advantage was going to be Denver and the altitude. Um, But for the one game, because one of those games is at home, but I I, I still thought like they were still probably going to be outmatched by us. Now I kind of feel like it's more of an even matchup. So it's really like which MVP is going to show up and, and carry the day for their team probably, or set their teammates enough up enough to win. Right. I mean, they, they both create a lot of opportunities for their teammates, but they do it in different ways, right? Like Steph is a combination of just like his, his, his off ball gravity and his passing and Jokic is like an elite, elite passer. And so um, they both definitely create a lot for their teammates and they both can score. So um, they both really raise um, the ceiling of their teams. They both really raise um, 
the level of their teammates. So I think it's really going to, you know, I'm looking at it and I think it's going to come down to two of them. I'm not sure who are going to be the X factors in the game. You mentioned, you know, Aaron Gordon for uh, Denver. I know like who some of our X factors are. GP2 has been playing tremendously um, for us. And, you know, you did mention Belly already and he's had, you know, like he was really great. I thought in the Christmas game, um versus the Suns he really showed up and in that fourth quarter stint out there with Steph when he was out there on the floor when Steph kind of like went off and he um they were like running hot you know pick and roll between the two of them I thought like he really did great during those minutes so um you have belly if we get pulled back which is a good chance then that's obviously great so I still think we have more threats on the floor possibly um than than Denver but do you think that's a fair assessment well, I think so. Yeah. Um, off the top of my head, who, is, who does Denver have right now? I think they have Campazo. You know, we all uh, we are all familiar with Faku. Um, they have In the a good rookie way, bones. He's annoying, but he does like good. Yeah. For them. Yeah. I mean, he, he's he's one of the few guys in the league who just annoys Steph visibly. I, if you remember last season where they had that matchup at Chase and Steph was kind of like, you know, talk, I don't know, like talking trash low key. Like he was like, you know, you can't guard me. You can't do anything about me to Faku and all that. But yeah, I love Faku uh, other than when he uh, faces the Warriors. So yeah, uh, who else they have? They have the rookie Bones Highland. They have Zeke Naji, second year guy. They have Jeff Green, you know, the evergreen Jeff Green, who's like, who's played for, I think like, I mean, yeah, like he's, yeah, I mean, they have some guys. I think it's probably going to be a close game. It's, it might be a close game because uh, Jokic just raises the raises the ante that, that much, that high. Uh, I forgot but, they it, picked up Jeff Green. I haven't watched too yeah. many Denver games this year. But in terms of depth, the Warriors uh, do have an advantage right now. Um but yeah, Draymond, Draymond just does so many things on both ends of the floor that they'll miss. And they, they did have, they did have, they did stagger Steph and Draymond this year more than usual. They did. Uh, so there is precedent for Steph playing without Draymond. They do that with, because of Steph's new rotation, right? Where the start of the second and the fourth quarter is Draymond's not there. Right. But yeah, either way, it's going to be difficult because especially on the defensive end, because Draymond can, Draymond has had given Jokic fits in the past, and you're gonna have to. I'm guessing they should probably give uh, Kuminga ch- a chance to defend Jokic to see what he can do. Just because he's such a strong physical presence down there, he's shown that he can defend in the post. So you know, uh, if I'm Steve Kerr, hey, just throw Kaminga to the fire and see what he can do against the reigning MVP. Hmm. We've thrown out a lot of names. Otto Porter is not one we mm-hmm. brought up. He's another big piece. Um, he closed the game for us on Christmas yeah. Day. He was excellent. He was clutch. Clutch. <laughs> Otto superstar. Otto superstar. Played like a superstar down the stretch. I loved it. I did just see when he was clowning the Suns bench. Yeah, he was like, I think it was that uh, three after at the top of the arc, and then he like, they called a timeout, and he looked immediately to the Suns bench yeah. and laughed. And, you know, I don't even know if he said anything. He just smiled. And that's like the worst kind of trash that you can talk. Didn't even say anything, right? So, yeah, that's like you great. didn't, ex- as if to say you didn't expect this from me, huh? All right. Yeah. And was, they were giving you know- him the ball. Yeah, and giving I mean, him the Steph ball. was giving it up to him. Yeah. And, like, also, it's, like, if you're going to, like, sell out on Steph, then, you know, like, we have the team to make you pay for that this year, you know? And uh, to me, that's to me that's part of what makes Steph the MVP or the front runner. You know, like, people are just looking at, like, yeah, I know his shooting is down a little bit so far this year. I'm really not that worried about it. But, um, you know, you know, you'll see some of the trolls like, oh, whatever, Otto saved him. And it's just like the fact that he knows to give up the ball to Otto to me is um, a valuable thing. The fact that or you have those games where like 
Wiggins might go off. You know, you heard Wiggins say, I've never been more open in my life ever, my career before playing on this team. Why do you think that is? That's because of Steph. To me, that's value, you know? And I don't think that's sometimes weighed as heavily as it should be. So I'm so happy yeah. for Otto. I mean, I know he came here to rehab his career. I'm starting to worry that he's going to like outprice us, like the way he's playing, mm -hmm. but um, he's been such a tremendous boost to the team. Yeah. Um, I, there was actually like word like a very curious word choice when he was at the post game conference uh last night he said where he wanted to showcase showcase what he could do when healthy and yeah that's kind of worrying if you're a warriors fan because showcasing something means that? you're showcasing it to the rest of the league right right so he's looking for that huge payday and and he deserves it he, he deserves it healthy. he does deserve it which um it's just going to be a shame if you lose him next next year, right? Because he's just, he's such show, so good for this team. Yeah. And he's a perfect I, I fit. I mean, I don't know much about like the numbers and contract stuff, but like there's no way we can afford him, right? Like the most we can give him is yeah. um, the MLE, cool. the taxpayer MLE, which is like 5.8 million, something like that. And yeah, we're fact of the matter, matter is the Warriors are still heavily deep in the tax so they're not going to have that much flexibility in the off season so he might be looking for that full MLE which is something around nine million plus so the big chance that we might lose him hopefully if we if the Warriors succeed this season if they win a championship that could convince him to stay for at least one more year but yeah I mean you got to have the mindset the, the mindset that we might not keep some of the guys that are succeeding this year. And that's okay. That's part of, and that's part of normal NBA happenings. Right. I mean, I kind of look at it as like the year that we took the chance on boogie. It didn't work out that well, but that was like the whole thing. It was like a year to come and rehab, you know, your rep and, and, and your value. And, you know, it wasn't really, we weren't expected to keep him beyond that year. So um, but Otto's working out, and so it hurts a little bit more when the person is working out, and then you lose them, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we can win that game. I mean, it's it's funny because like when the season first started, and even though I was very high on the Warriors, there were a lot of games that I went into like I don't know. I think this game is going to be close. You know, I still thought like we might get the, the win, but I thought it was going to be close. And then we were just like, these games weren't close to start. I mean, now that we're like depleted, I do think the game is going to be close, but I mostly think that because we're depleted. I mean, we are just like, to me, like in a different category than other teams. Do you think that about the Warriors? Like, are you seeing that or am I just being like a homer? <laughs> oh, no, no. Like, you know, um, we're 33 games, yeah, we're 33 games into this season, so you could have some pretty solid conclusions about this team. And the one conclusion that you can make is this team is on a different tier than any every other team in the league. You know, they're up there with the Suns and, let's say, from the East, the Bucks of the league. I would say those three teams are on a tier of their own when healthy. Uh, you could probably include the Jazz in there. I know how I know I know people are like, you know, kind of like uh, iffy on the Jazz, but the Jazz have been playing really well. Uh, let's see what happens in the playoffs. But yeah, um, you could the defense more so than the offense, it's a defense that convinces me that this team is elite because that defense is historically Historic. historically up there, right? Um, and Draymond's a big part of that too. But when you look at the roster, maybe with the exception of uh, GP2 with Wiggs, you will, don't really have anyone who you can say is an elite lockdown one-on-one -on -one defender. Like go throw him, throw him at someone, he'll get a stop, right? It's been more of the team defense, actually. Schematically, they're so connected. Their communication is top notch. I mean, if you just watch a game and you listen to Draymond and some of the guys, like even Belly, they yell out a lot of the schemes. Igadala, when he throws up that double fist, that means they're going into a zone. 
uh, their box and one. They threw out a box and one yesterday against uh, Chris Paul, actually, because the Suns stagger their stars, uh, CPN Booker. So they threw out that box and one. They denied CP uh, possession of the ball. And that was mainly their strategy last night is to not let CP dictate things because once he establishes that tempo, that rhythm, once he takes control of the half court game, it's pretty much uh, an uphill climb from then on. So it's the defense, it's knowing their personnel, it's rotations. They like you watch them defend on a string. It's beautiful I was to watch. Say that everybody can yeah. use that word with the Warriors. It's like they're on a string. You know, I what I found really. Um, interesting is that when Dre is not on the court the defense still seems to be holding up right and so to me that's the hallmark of the fact that like this isn't just like Draymond or they collapse like we have like a really 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 great defense obviously he's the quarterback of it and he's key but the team can still defend well even when Dre isn't out there and I mean I I saw the other day I, which game was it I think it was during the um Memphis game and like Dre and Steph like Dre wasn't out there with Steph and you saw Steph like getting everybody into place and calling out things and I'm like he's not getting enough credit for like what he's doing like on defense this year not just the way he's playing it but he's out there telling people where to be and what positions to be yeah in. I was really impressed by that I mean yeah he's basically um at least from a general or commander standpoint when Dre's not on the floor he's the one taking the reins and like directing people at his spots um and yeah you know the the point about Draymond not being on the floor and the, them being just as sharp uh I just I have the stats here like when Draymond's on they're like 103.8 uh uh defensive rating of 103.8 okay. when they're off it's 101.3 so they're slightly better actually without Draymond on the floor and I mean you could construe that to like matchups Draymond's facing right. better lineups right. but still but still right the fact they're surviving without Draymond and thriving it's it's pretty it's pretty like it's a testament to the culture to the accountability and you we've That's actually heard the really stories impressive. Yeah, we've heard the stories about Mike Brown being kind of like a taskmaster on defense during practices. He's awarding out uh, yeah. accolades like Steph. Steph won last like, month, right? Steph won last month and something <laughs> like that. So it's more the culture. It's more so than any individual player. It's the culture. You mentioned um, Andre a little bit earlier. Now, he didn't play last night in the Christmas game because of the knee swelling it would be huge if they could get him back for Denver. What role do you think he would still come off the bench or what role would you see him playing in that game if they had him back for Denver? He'd probably be coming off the bench okay. um, because if you start him, you don't pretty, um, he's pretty much, I'm struggling to find an offensive fit with the starters, but yeah, anyway, what is the starting lineup going to look like without Dre? Who do you think they're going to put out there? Um, I'm blanking out right now. Who did they start against Phoenix? They started Steph. They started. Who was his two guard? Uh, Didn't they go out. with um, um, GP2? Oh, they, yeah, they went to GP2. Yeah. yeah um, auto if, started. GP2, Otto. Uh, Loon and Dre, right? Out. Loon and Dre, yeah. Um. If you put if you put Andre in the starting lineup, that's kind of clashes with GP, right? Because there are non-shooters, there are two non-shooters on the floor. And basically the only shooters you have is Steph and Otto. So I don't think they start with Andre. Um he's so gonna come, keep come off GP the bench. Too. Yeah. So are they putting Belly out there? They could, but I think um uh, Kerr has this uh tendency to preserve the rotations the bench units as much as he can so, Kuminga, so, you think. so maybe Kaminga if there's like a, a big change but yeah I mean Andre when Andre's out on the floor and I noticed this most during the Celtics game he's he kind of can replicate a bit of that Draymond uh free safety role 
Uh, so in the second unit, if he is available tomorrow, he's going to be that Draymond role where he's going to be plugging holes whenever there are holes. Uh, he's not necessarily going to guard one guy all, all during all of his minutes on the floor. He's going to be directing stuff. He's going to be calling out schemes and all that. So hopefully he's available tomorrow. Uh, the, that knee swelling, I think, is going to take a while. It took a while the last time it swelled up. So it did. maybe not. Maybe not. But hopefully he's available. Well, I'm hoping we get Jordan Poole back. I mean, that should be around the 10 day mark. Um, so, I mean, yeah. I know he has to do like what a cardiac test or something like that, they call it. But I mean, if he had, if he wasn't experiencing symptoms, hopefully he comes out of protocol and then he gets like right back to playing. And also the conditioning too. I mean, he, like a few days of not being out there and playing basketball and working out, that can do a lot, you know, to your conditioning. I can, but they're depleted. So I don't know if they have the ability to really hold on. I mean, I know Kerr likes to yeah. play safe, but Jordan's a young guy. So you're kind of hoping you could throw him back out there more quickly, maybe than one of the older, you know, vets, I think. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you had to guess the opening lineup, you're probably thinking it's going to be Steph, GP2, um, Otto, Otto, Kaminga, Kaminga, and Loom. Looney. Yeah. Or, he, yeah. That would be my ideal lineup. But I don't know. Sometimes Kerr goes with experience over youth. So yeah, let's see. Maybe on and... maybe maybe he'll go with Andre. Maybe he'll go with Belly. Let's see. Yeah, I don't I don't really mind Kaminga being out there. Like he's to me been earning the minutes that he's playing and he's been exceeding in them. Did you see that reverse layup he did? Mm -hmm. I mean, of course you I saw mean, it because you were watching yeah, like, the game, but that was... like, like, I kind of like once that happened live, and thankfully they went to a timeout. I, I, I opened my, I opened my like my app that records the clip. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna post this. Like, <laughs> it's too good to not post. And I'm like, yeah. So yeah, I mean, to do that in crunch time i would say i don't know if that was crunch Were you time per se expecting that move when he started to move to the basket i mean uh cool. honestly i kind of expected him to dunk it you know because he's just gonna go straight hard at the rim but no he went with finesse he did. over power yeah which i did not expect i didn't know he could do that it and i don't think gorgeous. anyone else anyone else on the floor knew that he could do that because yeah, like everyone was surprised. Everyone was surprised. Everyone's like, "Oh my God, this dude's 19 and he's doing stuff like that." You know, he's not even, he's not even legal, legal. He's not even legally allowed to gamble yet. I think. Yeah, I don't even know because I don't gamble, but I need to start. I've got to tell you, <laughs> I'm definitely old <laughs> enough to do it. Um, people kind of were wrong about Kaminga like I mean I don't know where did you stand on him before the Warriors drafted him um I was kind of neutral about it uh because obviously I didn't I didn't expect the Warriors to be this good too I mean not a lot of people did expect the Warriors to be this good really? where did you expect them to be like what was your prediction I was expecting them to finish around the fifth fourth uh in the west around yeah, that area fourth being They're, the highest fifth being... Fourth being the highest I didn't I wasn't expecting them to be in the play-in and uh if they did if they if they managed to avoid the play-in I would have branded that as a success but obviously we're not like we're not in the play-in. We're not in the fifth and fourth. We're like up there. So, you know, so obviously. So in you, Joe. Oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> I mean, like I had my, I had my, um, I had my object, objective, objectivity glasses on when I was making that prediction. But yeah, I mean, to, ha to be this high, obviously the calculus changes and in a lot of ways, like the development and the championship the combination of those develop of those um objectives it changes right and a lot of people uh you know a lot of people on twitter really objected to that plan like how can you develop rookies 
and try to win a championship at the same time. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, they were completely wrong. Maybe, like, things can still happen that could justify that notion. Uh, we're still not even not halfway through the season yet, but right. it's working. <laughs> it's working. Uh, Kaminga is developing at a rate not a lot of people expected him to develop. And hopefully that goes for Wiseman as well. Uh, he's had a tough, he's had a tough two yeah. seasons. Uh, he got thrown to the fire last season, like playing three college games, and you know, facing off against the the Jokic's, the Aitons of the league. And they didn't and, know the Warriors didn't put him in the best position to succeed. Yeah. They didn't have a development plan for him. They tried to make him the focal point. They were force feeding him. I mean, there was just a lot going on out there that. Like, to me right now, the way Kaminga is being used, like, yes, you're seeing bright spots for him, but he also wasn't just thrown into the fire. It, it's a little, mm -hmm. it, it's different. He didn't get that opportunity. And so, and and even if Wiseman is less developed than Kaminga, like, I don't care. Like, we don't need his roster spot right now, I guess, is the way that I look at it. So, um I was never of the position that you can't develop and um, also have a championship bet team that wins. Because first of all, I just always felt like the Spurs were proof that that wasn't true, even if it was just one team. Like, I get that people yeah. thought it's not the norm. Um, I understood the idea that, like, maybe you don't want, like, half the roster being young guys, right? And I, I think, I to me, the idea behind you not being able to develop players is really to me about whether or not, um, to me, in my opinion, it's really about whether or not you have to rely on them, right? Like if you have to rely on those young players to be a part of like the winning, then I think you can't do it. But we're not, we don't have to rely on the young guys. I mean, we're using Kaminga now and the fact that you might be able to actually use him and get quality minutes out of him as a bonus. But even without Kaminga, without Moody, without Wiseman, the team is deep enough that like you don't have to rely on them. So to me, it's a luxury to be developing them at the back of the bench. That's how I look at it. Yeah, you know, a lot of people still wanted to like trade them. So that that was my thoughts on it. But what what do you think now? You know, are you of the position that they should keep developing? Do you think that they should trade any of them? What are what are your thoughts? Um I think they don't have to make a move right now because we still have the greatest move that they can make right now is to just throw Clay Thompson on the floor. <laughs> right. You know. So we we don't even have all we don't we we haven't seen clay yet and he's the best acquisition acquisition quote unquote that the team can make because the moment he steps on the floor they improve immensely i mean right. sure we we still don't know what he looks like coming off that injury but as long as he has that shot he still has that shot and he still has around 80% of his lateral movement which is, he's not going to have that right away. But right. if he can at least keep people in front of him, you know, he's going to be a big asset to have, obviously. Because he's likely, no matter what, going to be a better defender than, than Poole, most likely, right? Yeah. Like, and yeah. I think that what you said was really important about, like, as soon as he steps on the court, because he's going to be defended like he's Clay Thompson no matter what. Like, no mm -hmm. one's going to care that he was out for two years. They're going to be like, oh, that's Clay Thompson, and he's going to yeah. open up the court, right? Yeah, no matter no matter how, how bad or good you're shooting the ball, if your reputation precedes you as a shooter, you're going to be guarded as a shooter. I mean, you see Steph, he's, he's shooting. He hasn't been shooting the ball well, but he's still being guarded like Steph. So, you know, right. that, that will never leave you. Yeah, so I mean, what about everyone's concerns about their interior defense? Are you concerned about that? There's been concern about their their interior defense, really, yeah. because last time I checked, they're they're allowing something like 
I think they were their first in opponent rim percentage or frequency, something like that. So, you know, rim protection is much more than just blocks. It's also contesting at the rim. It's also preventing uh, ball handlers at the point of attack from penetrating too. So I'm not really that concerned about their rim protection. Um, and people, I, th- I mean, I think when people see matchups, like, you know, the first time we played the Suns and Aiton was eating uh, or, right. or like, like the other day was like Jaron Jackson, right? Where he mm-hmm. was just like, like, we really didn't have anything to stop him. Or what, what was the guy mm-hmm. on um, the Clippers too? Um, what's his name? The one who just kept grabbing board after board after board. Um, who was this against? Uh... I forget his name. You know who I'm talking about. I'll look it up and I'm going to look it up. But, you know, there are some games. The thing is, it hasn't stopped us from winning those games, right? But people mm-hmm. see that and they get nervous. And I think what they're saying is, what happens when we play a team like the Bucks? And my response yeah. to that is like, no one is stopping Giannis. Like, so if the whole life, and you don't even know if we're going to play the Bucks, right? Like if they even make it out, mm-hmm. if they make it out the West, you don't know that it's going to be the Bucks on the other side. It could be the yeah. Nets. It could be the Heat. So like, do you disrupt the team just to get a player in case you meet up with the Bucks? And I still don't think that that means that you know, the Heat seem to do a pretty good job of, of defending the Bucks. I, we can't do what hmm. the Heat do. I just, I don't understand it. But I mean, you tell you, me. You're the expert. Yeah. I look at you as the expert. Well, the thing with the Bucks is they're pretty, they're, they're pretty big and they're pretty long. So I don't know what, how, what acquisition, like when you look at the, look at the available players out there, that you can make to prevent Zubac. that. I'm sorry, Zubac. That's what I was thinking. Oh, okay. Do you remember that second against the Clippers? The Clippers, like he yeah, yeah, yeah. He was we grabbing. Grab a board. <laughs> yeah. Um. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any acquisition out there that you can make to prevent what the Bucks can do. So, so I'm going to tell you some of the names that have been thrown out there, right? Okay, I mean, okay, okay. Obviously, when the Pacers. News so bonus so bonus and turner really, right yeah turner was one of the names yeah the other name that some people are like really into is woods from um the rockets like because yeah christian into- wood yeah so what do you think about either one of those people and i mean in terms of like what you're giving up because people felt very comfortable giving up loon um <laughs> and 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 wiseman would you yeah. give up wiseman for either one of those guys um, right now, I would say no, because just because we haven't really seen what Wiseman can do at this point, because it's a bit, quite a bit hasty and unfair to not at least give him the opportunity to show that he has improved, that he's a different player. But in terms of the names that you mentioned, I did write I a, a piece question. on. I keep throwing okay, go more ahead. questions before you can even finish. Sure, sure, what go do, ahead. What do you say to the person that says? Well, he hasn't played. So how do you expect mm-hmm. improvement? Like, it's just going to be a repeat of last year because he yeah. hasn't played. He's been on the bench. Mm-hmm. What I mean, I know what my response is to that. But what's your response when someone would say that? Well, how do you know he, how do you know he has improved if you don't play him, right? I mean, that's what you play him for. You throw him out there. And I understand. I understand the the reasoning behind that like he doesn't have reps against actual nba competition and all that but he also has a lot of development coaches around him he has had a lot of workouts he's had the time to improve on the little skills that needs to be improved he has a lot of ears around him he has a lot of mouths around him telling him what he should do what he shouldn't do in that kind of thing so you know you should at least throw him out there they threw him out there with yeah right they threw him out there with three college games and little like they didn't have a summer league they didn't have any uh time for developing him this time they have the time to, they have had all the time in the world to develop him so you should at least see what that the, the fruit of that development has born has born like 
I agree because no. some of his struggles were about like his strength, right? And he wasn't strong yeah. enough yet. And he's he's put on some some weight and muscle, right? So that to me is improve improvement. That's improvement to his body, right? He's had the chance to just sit on the bench and watch, right? Which is like basically watching film, right? So I'm sure he's watched film. He's also watching the team live. You know, he has, after a play finish, Steph going over him and saying, okay, so when you're out there, this is what I'm going to do. This is what it's going to look like. And Andre in his ears and Dre in his ears. And yeah, like you said, development coaches working with him on his footwork, right? We at least, I think, deserve to give him the chance to show what that looks like now on the NBA court in spot minutes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Spot minutes. In spot minutes and to see, right? Like, I just don't understand. I don't understand it when you consider how wrong people were about Jordan Poole. To me, how they've been wrong about Kuminga. How, in my opinion, they've been wrong about Andrew Wiggins. Like, yeah. give this man a chance. Like, I just don't understand but um, I wouldn't trade him either. But that's th- those are my thoughts. Okay, so we're both on the same page for not trading him. But if they were going to trade him, like, what do you think a guy like Turner or Woods could bring? Like, do you think they're helping when you're matching up against Giannis? Turner obviously brings the rim protection, mm-hmm. uh, which could be huge against Giannis. And the thing about Giannis is there's a few, there are a few players in the league who can defend him one on one. Uh, not a lot of teams have attempted to defend him one on one, but with um, a guy like Turner, you you have a guy who can just uh, have reps on him down low. You could also, when Giannis is in transition, you could Turner can be that one man wall, that rare one man wall that you can throw at him. Uh, with Christian Wood, is more off on the offensive end because he's a very, very versatile big who can score inside, can score outside. He has a pretty decent jumper. So on the defensive end of things, Wood obviously isn't going to move the needle that much against a Giannis. And I actually did write a piece uh, about the, a potential fit with Domont- Domantas Sabonis on the Warriors, uh, which, you know, had a mixed reaction, of course, because, you know, they had, you had the don't trade anyone crowd. You had the... Uh, Sabonis can't play defense crowd, or we'd rather have Turner crowd all coming at me, you know, which I don't mind, you know, but um, because I was just throwing out the potential fits fit out there with Sabonis and Sabonis obviously isn't going to be someone who is going to stand out defensively. Uh, Obviously he's not going to be the solution to Giannis, uh, but he does have that profile of being a big man who can be that passing hub down low. Uh, you know, when you consider the fact that the Warriors run a lot of split action, they run a lot of stuff at the elbows, uh, Sabonis fits that to a T. Um, but other than that, Turner... Why can't their historic defense just be the answer to Giannis? Like, right, why, yeah. Why is that not the answer? That's the thing, right? Like, when people think about these theoretical trades, they think of it as, can he guard this person? Can he guard that person? And that kind of speaks to the fact that most people are still thinking of defense as a one-on-one matchup based thing, right? Nowadays, it's not that simple anymore. Like it's schematic, it's rotations, it's defensive IQ. And uh, let me use uh, Sabonis as an example. Like he's not the best one-on-one individual defender out there, but he is very sound schematically. Like, he makes the rotations. He can blitz guards if you need him to blitz guards. Uh, we have someone similar to that, too, on our team, Otto, right? Otto Porter. He's not the best one-on-one individual defender. But he knows how to rotate he's when he's on defender. the weak. Yeah, he's a team defender. When he's on that weak side and someone's going over to drive because someone got beat at the point of attack, he's going to rotate over and block that shot or at least contest that shot. He's a great you know, rebounder, too. He's a great rebounder, too. And Sabonis is a great rebounder. So, you know, defense is more than, like, my point is, defense is just more than just one-on-one. 
you can't just think of it from that perspective. And, you know, I'm not saying they should trade for Sabonis or a Turner or a Wood, but if you have either one of them, it's not going to hurt that much your defense as like people like people think that our defense is going to drop off if we add someone like a wood or a bonus but i'm not i don't agree with that right well i mean look people thought our defense was going to drop off because we were losing <laughs> more and, yeah and and um kelly Oubre and like uh, gonna, you know just for it. transparency's sake i was kind of, i was one of those people but i, I like uh, I think I wrote something about like they were a top five defense, and I wouldn't be surprised if they like dropped slightly to around the top ten. I was one of those people, and now so we're, like, you know. The top defense. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Wow. But yeah, I'm, but yeah, I mean, they're good. I appreciate they're elite. though that you just say like, look, I thought that too when I was wrong. <laughs> we have some people um in dub's twitter who like do not like to admit that they were wrong about anything they will just <laughs> die on the hill defending their positions um i appreciate that honesty so yeah so the dubs are they're rolling they're doing better than you even thought so and you're a wise man so now i feel extra wise that i kind of thought they were going to be i th- i had them as a top 3 team in the league i'm not going to say that they're num- that they um like it didn't it wouldn't surprise me if they were one i just didn't think they would be lower than top 3 cuz quite frankly i thought last year they were truly a, a 4 or 5 seed like i didn't think where they finished reflected the actual team that they were so like to me saying that they were still like a four or five seed means like there was no improvement to me but we added players who I thought would help you know move the needle some and I knew we were having clay coming back so um the fact that they're doing this before clay even comes is like I I think they're clear of the league I think they're the best team um but you know of of course people think i'm a biased uh you know warriors fan so but i you know it's it's really not based in bias i don't it's it's i i get that people want to temper expectations until you see clay but i still feel like they're just not giving enough credence to proven champions and steph and dre like why are you doubting these two look at what they've done and now you're adding back the 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 third person who's a part of that trio right like they've done this they know how to do this they know how to win and we should be giving more credit to them rather than saying everyone else the suns didn't even win anything but i'm supposed to care that they made it to the finals who cares they made it to the finals when the warriors were not available when the lakers well Lakers are another story but you know what I mean like and I don't like to discredit like the Suns are a great team so that's not what I mean but people are just like they were the Western Conference champions I don't give a shit we went to the finals five times and won three of them who cares (laughs) why do I give more credit because they were there last year versus the people who have won you know people like well that was how many years ago but I'm like but the only reason that they stopped going is because they got injured. It wasn't because they lost their ability. It's not because they mm. stopped being good. So the fact that it happened two years ago doesn't matter to me, but that's me. You know, everyone kind of looks at these things differently. And that that 15 and 5 finish last season, that that was telling actually. Exactly. Looking back. Yeah. Because Yo, that I was say the... that all the time. I said this is just a continuation of what they did to close the season. Yeah. And you consider the fact that they didn't play Wiseman and Ubre, and that coincided with them just going on this run because they started playing, they're playing their own, their brand of basketball because they didn't have to adjust to an Ubre not knowing where to be and not knowing who to pass it to and not screening for a step and all that. They didn't have to run as much pick and roll because Wiseman was there. You know, they Kerr had to adjust and run more pick and roll with Wiseman, which, you know, it worked pretty well with Steph on the floor because running pick and roll with Steph is pretty much low hanging fruit, especially if you're a seven foot right. athletic center. But yeah, I mean, once you had, once you gave JTA more minutes because JTA is more of a fit in terms of a playmaker in terms of defense. Uh, once pool started showing signs of that improvement late last season, they went on this run. And Steph being Steph, you know, playing at an MVP level and Draymond playing at an all-defense level, at a defensive player of the year level. 
mm-hmm. and they went on the run and sh- they were one win away from facing the Jazz last se- last playoff so yeah i mean that 15 and 5 start was like i think people should have looked at that more and said this is going to continue on because there is continuity from last season to this season and they added pieces better fitting yeah. pieces yeah um what is the guy who um does thinking basketball what is his name uh, ben taylor ben taylor yeah. um he apparently said uh, one of my previous guests said that he said that that run to end the season they were at a 60 game win pace Mm-hmm. Um, while doing that and um, you know I kind of hate when people always bring up that when Wiseman was out because I feel like he gets like the brunt of that but yeah. like because I, I don't think it's I, I get it like Wiseman was out and they could do different things I also think that they were just trying to win games at that time right like I don't think if Wiseman was still there that the record would have looked any different because he may have played less minutes. Steve Kerr just may have would have used him differently, you know, mm-hmm. but I, I think early in the season, they were like, okay, let's try to incorporate Wiseman. We're developing this year. I don't think they were gunning as hard for wins or, you know, trying as hard. And so I think that was also a, a mindset change as well towards the end of the season. Well, yeah, you could. Kerr was actually like when Wiseman was healthy, was still healthy. He was actually, he didn't start him anymore, and he was just playing minutes, uh, bench minutes with Jordan Poole because right. they were. He was kind of experimenting with that Poole Wiseman combination because they were they were kind of developing like chemistry together, and especially that's what in the I pick and roll. To see when Wiseman yeah. comes back and he's going to mm-hmm. be coming off the bench, and 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 I actually think like. Because, you know, sometimes sometimes people still talk about Poole's um, inconsistency. And I think that, like, when he's just, like, coming off the bench as the sixth man, like, I mean, he's still going to have a lot of minutes. But I think you'll see more consistency from him. But I'm, I'm excited to kind of see what him and Wiseman do as a duo on the bench. Yeah. Um, Poole, I see someone like Poole as someone who thrives without I don't want to say thrive. As someone who can perform maybe marginally better without Steph there as I his agree. partner. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Because uh Poole is kind of uh kind of demands a bit more of the ball of, of the usage. Yeah. So once you have him there as the sixth man in the second unit, I think he's gonna flourish more. I agree. One hundred percent. I think you're spot on. He's gonna be that Steph analog in the bench unit. Yeah. Bench units. He's already been a Steph analog in yeah. a lot of ways this season. So absolutely, yeah. mm-hmm. I agree with that. Okay, so let's just really quickly the MVP race right now. You know, there was a little period of time that, like, you know, before Katie went into protocols, he had like a couple of big games, and he was missing most of his team. So people were like, "Oh, he's the MVP. He's overtaken Steph." That kind of lasted for like a few days because then Steph had the <laughs> the Memphis game and we just won Christmas. And I think people still kind of fully feel like Steph is like back as the, the, the MVP front runner. I personally never thought he stopped being the front runner. Just maybe KD closed the gap a little bit, but it does seem like right now Steph is the front runner. So would you have KD as two or would you have Joker? Or would you have Giannis or someone else? Right now, I have KD as number two, but Giannis is creeping up too. I mean, they, they talk about KD creeping up to Steph. Giannis is creeping up to KD, I think, and for that number two spot. Okay. And if if current if the KD's out, I think he's he's out with safety health and safety protocols. So Giannis has a lot of time to catch up. He just had a big and Christmas game. He had a big Christmas game. I mean, that game against the Celtics, he was the Giannis of the finals. Right. in many ways so and the one thing about Giannis is the consistency like uh, I think people had a bit of a voter fatigue with Giannis because he won two straight MVPs and, and but you look at his stats he's been consistent you know he's averaging something around 27 12 and 6 this season those are MVP type numbers right and you know um he's creeping up to KD in my opinion 
Uh, KD can do enough to hold on to his second spot, but I do think Steph has that hold on the number one spot. I do. Uh, I do. Most like, you know, not just because he has the narrative. Narrative is a strong thing, but he also, like you mentioned this earlier, he also does things on the floor that the stats don't capture, right? Or it doesn't he, directly the capture. The impact stats do capture. Yeah, the impa- yeah, it doesn't directly capture if you look at the box score numbers, right? Right. So not counting stats per se, although his counting stats yeah. are pretty good. Not his shooting percentages, but I mean, he's still what, averaging like 27. And yeah. Um, what is he second? He's second leading scorer right now. He's right? second behind KD, yeah. And his three point percentage is 39.9, right. which is pr- low for Steph. That's his, that's on pace to be his career low, and that is a career high for most players out there. So right. that's and we kind know of he's going to still finish over forty, and he's taking yeah. thirteen threes a game right now. So which is why his like effective and true shooting is actually not even that far off from like a KD. He's been more of a volume, like way more of a volume shooter this season than he has, and yeah. that the record chase plays it played a huge part into that. Right. But yeah, that that's gonna creep over forty percent because of law of averages and stuff like that. And the but, twos, um, the twos looked good yesterday, and the finishing. His rim looked, finishing looked great yesterday. Yeah, like and, it's coming back to normal. Yeah, there was this concern right about his finishing because it's been at at its lowest uh, in years, and uh, you know he didn't re- he didn't particularly look like he lost a step compared to last season. That's so, so important. That's why I can tell people like he's just missing. Like he's just it, missing shots. Yeah. Right. It's like it's not an inability to create space. It's not an inability to get to his spots. It's not like a burst. He's just like I mean he's literally missing bunnies like just right there mm-hmm. like no one is stopping him. So I would I really wasn't worried. I find it hilarious when people get worked up like this about stuff, but. I, I expect the law of averages to pan out. And I know people are like, man, he's going to have to have a crazy second half of the season. But I think he will because that's what he's done like year after year. So I'm really not worried about it too much. I think if he just plays to his level and they remain with like the top record in the NBA, I don't see how he's not winning the MVP. I just don't see it. Yeah, I think I think he has a hold on it. Uh, it's it's cl- it's. It's closer than this. It's closer than some people think it is, but it's also like not super duper close to the point that KD is, um, you know, KD has can just overcome Steph at this point, you know, and I think if you look at the, uh, I don't know how much stock you put in the analytics but when you look at some of the impact stuff some of the on off stuff Steph is like a couple of points above KD in terms of you know plus minus and all that I think a lot of the voters do not all of them but I think not all of them yeah I think a large number of the voters do and that's why I kept trying to tell people when that little stretch I mean KD's been great all season so I'm, I'm not trying to say that he was only great in those few games but what I was saying is like, you know, when when they did the straw poll, Steph had mm-hmm. 93 first place votes. If you yeah. think based on a two week stretch, he went from like 93 first place votes to like Katie surpassing him. That would have been like insane because like when you just look at other metrics, like even while he was shooting poorly, his impact stats were still insane. Yeah. And that's that's a testament to his impact. Right. Right. And he improves the offense and the, just being on the floor. So, and we, we, we've we known that. I mean, it, like people who are connected to the Warriors, Warriors fans, they've been knowing that. But, you know, I think it's just right now that the mainstream, um, mainstream NBA collective mindset is realizing that, which is a shame, you know, it's a, it's a shame because if they had realized that a couple of years earlier, then I think Steph would definitely be, uh, get, getting his flowers, getting his due flowers earlier than just you know at this stage of his career where he's like what turning thirty four. Right. He's uh he's he's I would say he's still at the prime of his career, but he's kind of like on that late end of right. his prime. So yeah, it's kind of a shame that he's just getting his deserved 
uh, recognition right now. But yeah, I mean, better late than never, right? Thankfully, he has a game that's probably going to translate to him playing for at a high level for, I think, a number more years. So um, I'm enjoying this period of him starting to get his flowers. So Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's been great to see. Um, You know, what, what do you think about, we have Denver, those are the next two games. And then they have, I want to say it's Utah and then the Heat. Miami, yeah. So I think, I think if, if Dre is actually out for 10 days, you, when do you know when that six day change went into effect for the protocols? I have no idea. I Last time I heard, it wasn't official yet. They were just discussing it. Okay. I might be wrong on that because I'm not updated on it. So yeah, but. No, it's okay. So let's just say on the long end that it's 10. I think he would miss all of those games. And the He's earliest gonna, yeah. the earliest he would be back would be for the Mavs game if it was just 10 days. And yeah, he the did, Mavs. Um, yeah. That that guy, Playoff Draymond, he's like a Twitter account, but he's like established a rapport with Dre. It's it's really mm-hmm. strange. So he actually tweeted earlier because he messed it. He like DM Dre or he didn't DM him. I think he just like posted something on Instagram kind of like, um, I hope Dre's okay and maybe tagged him and Draymond responded and was like, I'm home, I'm chilling, I'm fine. So it sounds like he's not experiencing symptoms, which is good because we know the first time, I think he actually did have like a, a little bit of a rough time yeah. with COVID. So if he's not experiencing symptoms, that means he would probably be back for that Mavs game. Um, so those next four games, though, the ones that scare me the most are Utah and the Heat. But Utah, just because their offense can be so good. And sort of the Heat, because, like, you know, you have a player like Tyler Hero that can just, like, start, get going. But, I mean, they're missing some guys, too. So yeah. all of those teams, except for Utah right now, because, you know, every every day it's changing. We're getting these shams and and woes you know tweets every minute but for right now utah seems to be fully intact although they're they it, i think it was tweeted earlier that um it was announced earlier that they're they're not playing donovan in the next two games because he has like a lower back strain but i don't know that that he would be out for that game versus us so those are the next four games you likely don't have dre we might be getting some of the other guys back but i mean are those all winnable games or do you think it's just like really far fetched? I know it's going to be hard, but like, can they win each of those games without Dre? I know anything's possible, but I'm just saying realistically, can they win those? Is that practical? I would say both of the Denver games are winnable. The Utah game is, it's, it's going to be rough. I would, I would That's think the hardest just, one, right? Just because Utah is, uh, has been pretty good this season. Uh, yeah. Like you said, like it's not, impossible but i would say it's improbable um that's probably the hardest one you think it's probably gonna be the hardest one miami is winnable just because they don't have bam they don't have jimmy yeah they don't have jimmy they don't have pj too they don't have tuck and you know hero hero I, I've, jimmy? I've been is he out too i think so last time i checked i'm, I'm not even sure i'm not up to date i knew bam i'm not sure out. yeah Okay, but I'm going to be out. Some yeah. guys. Yeah, actually, Jimmy's Jimmy just got back uh, tonight. Okay, against the Magic, so he's going to be back. So that might make it tough. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, Denver games are even winnable. Miami slightly more than Utah. Utah is going to be a uphill climb, just because they're just so good this season. And so if they finished in, in those four games, if they went three and one, that would be like great. Yeah. Right? That, and even that if they did awesome. two and two, that would still be pretty good, all things considering. Yeah, that would be good. They're actually getting wigs too in the middle of that stretch. Right. They're getting That's wigs back. Thing. They're getting wigs back. They yeah. should have pool back. And I don't mm-hmm. know, maybe on the late end of that, they would have Lee back too. I mean, Moses might. Yeah. And if and if, if Andre comes back at all, you know. Then they're in yeah. like a much better position. Three one, maybe even a two two. That's that wouldn't be bad. So uh obviously worst case scenario is they lose like they go out one three or oh four 
which is unideal but understandable because they're just missing all they're just missing guys you know right. it's not ideal but yeah that's that's the situation right now you have, right. To, you have to deal with it so bar barring injury and obviously COVID is unpredictable but barring injury do you think this team is going to finish with over 60 wins this season right I now they're so. projected yeah. to like 67 right yeah I would say so I think that's a safe bet yeah that's incredible if, if they win 60 plus games you gotta just hand step the mvp like i don't see yeah. how you can give it to anyone else because that's remarkable yeah unless unless someone pulls like unanimous steph numbers other than steph i don't i don't see how if you, they win like 60 plus that you don't give steph the mvp i mean the team record is there the stats are there uh yeah i mean it's his to lose at this point. I'm loving this season. Are you enjoying this season? Yeah. I yeah, I'm enjoying it. I mean, call us biased, but you know, that those are the facts, you know. And I, I'm one of the more objective guys on when it comes to my Warriors analysis. But I do think are. I do think I... Steph has that in the bag right now. And you know, knock on wood that he doesn't experience a setback or anything like that. He's going to have it. He's, he's just going to be winning his third MVP, hopefully his fourth ring, you know. And finals MVP. That's long overdue. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Long and then watch, G- overdue. watch GP2 win finals MVP. Oh, no, just kidding. <laughs> Don't even put it into the universe. I just, I cut off all that talk when anyone says it. Um Yeah. Listen, Joe, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for the conversation and it's been for joining so fun. Me. Um, yeah. Let them know where can they follow you. If you're if you're one of my followers or listeners to this show and you're on Twitter and you're not following Joe, I would be shocked. But how do they follow you? Where do they find you? Um, mostly a Twitter guy at Joe Virai NBA. Uh, can you also read my work at Golden State of Mind and Dub Nation HQ? And that's pretty much it. Just keep following me keep uh watching those rewatch threads and those film analyses um yeah i mean thank you for the big thank you for the support i've grown the most this year uh you know it's been a very very merry christmas indeed uh Uh, and hopefully more hopefully more blessings to come we're big joe fans over here and what's the golden state of mind handle if they want to check that out at unstoppable baby unstoppable baby Woo, that's which you know the dubs have been this season but for yes. the most part so yeah <laughs> well joe i'm wishing you um even though i will see you on the timeline a very happy new year and um just a re- you know wonderful and safe holiday season i actually recently caught covid and it prevented me oh. from going home to see my family so today was the first day i tested negative so oh, congratulations congratulations um, thank you so i'm excited about that so i'm just hoping for one more day of negative tests kind of like the nba guys and then i'm gonna mm-hmm. go see my family and at least enjoy the new year with them so and maybe um, at, the, at this rate maybe they'll call you up on the roster too <laughs> someone said that online like go take the place of chioza you know yeah. he's not a fan favorite evil staff. Uh-huh. like wanamaker 2.0 oh gosh uh, i mean i know lately we don't have a choice but it's been sort of yeah brutal. yeah um but yeah seriously thank you so much i appreciate you coming on and um you guys follow joe he's great take care my friends take care